Before we start, I would like to thank the DevGam team for gathering all of us here today. And also, I'd like to thank every one of you for taking time of your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, please show of hands who of you traveled at least two hours to get here. Cool. Uh, who of you traveled four hours to get here? Okay, five hours or more. Cool. And the others, have you stayed here from last year's event? Yes, <laughs> that's good. Uh, our next speaker traveled five hours to get here, and he has a really unique story. Uh, the company he co-founded with their first game, Bitbody, faced bankruptcy several times. It seemed to be a failure, but now this game sold over 700,000 units, and that's great, that's pretty awesome. And our speaker, Wolf Lang, is going to share with us his unique experience and his thoughts on how to make the first game successful and skip some problems they faced with Bitbody. So please welcome our next speaker, Wolf Lang. Hello, Moscow. Hello, DevCam. Uh, thanks so much for having me here on this gigantic stage. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I really love those type of talks where I have my own microphone, can run around like Steve Jobs, hold up my finger, say words like we were thinking and imagining and then and so on and so on. So it's really, really nice to be here. Uh, you're going to listen to about 45 minutes to my crazy stories and after that we're going to have a little Q&A together with Elena. And I also want to thank Elena for giving me such a kind introduction by already. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. Yeah, sure. It's uh, five euros. You can just put it in my um, bag. <laughs> no, no, it's a discount. It's just two euros today. No, no. Okay, Thank I'm you. just. Um, yeah. So, so okay. I already gave her the reason why I'm here. Uh, the reason why I'm here is Beat Buddy. And um, just, just a quick survey. Has anybody ever heard of the title, in some form? We're gonna. Okay, some, some hands. Okay, okay. That's good. That makes me extremely proud because we also have a Russian translation since three weeks, um, which is very, very nice. So let me start. Um, so there is this myth, if you're starting in the game industry, uh, about um, being successful with your first game. Some veterans say it's impossible. Um, some people say it is possible. Sometimes you don't know the whole story behind it. Um, if it's really their first game, because some developers are super, super successful and it seemed to be their first title, but actually they might have been producing games in the last six years, but they've just failed so many times that nobody even knew that they were making games before. And I want to, um, first of all, kind of analyze my definition of a game, of a release of a, of a first game. Then I want to talk a bit about cases um, of successful games. Um, and then I want to talk most of the time about um, that we actually had a game that failed and became a success. And I want to explain a little bit on that point about um, what happened at that time and uh, maybe also try to explain this definition of success, which can be for our smaller developers sometimes pretty hard to find out. And um, yeah, but I think I'm just going to start. I think I'm just going to start with the definition for me, what is the first game? So um, most of us, of course, we start developing games. At least we write a Facebook post or something like that or tell it to our grand grandmother, please buy my game. So we, all of us do at least a little bit of marketing, some people more, some people less. And somehow we put it on a platform out for, out for distribution. I think everybody can agree on that. Um, the important part is then, um, if you really, in my definition, consider it a real release, then you have the face of consequences that very likely it's not going to make a lot of revenue at first time. And you're going to feel bad about yourself, you're going to feel miserable about yourself. And a lot of people stop at that point. A lot of people stop at that point. So for me, there are no real developers because everybody can start making a game, everybody can make one Facebook post, and everybody can, you know, bring it out. But to face failure to face that you're not making money, that the whole world has not been waiting for your game. This is the part where you become a true developer because you start developing your second game. And this is for me the whole circle of a um, first game development. So 
Let me look at some stories that inspired me when I started 2009. Uh, one of the games that I was uh, very, very passionate and still passionate about is, for example, Monaco from Andy Schatz. I think a lot of people heard about the game. It was an IGF winner, actually multiple times, I think. And um, for me, there was always the story of the American Indies um, having those great ideas coming out of nowhere and then releasing this awesome title and, 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 and becoming um, not only rich and famous, but in this wonderful position to actually develop their second game without worrying too much about who's going to finance it, where they get the money from, and so on. So that was always my dream. And um, so let's take a look at the development process of Monaco. It was developed by two people most of the time. Um, then it won one big marketing step was, of course, that it won the IGF. Uh, very, very important for the game. So there was a big hype around the game. Um, it was sold, I think, simultaneous on uh, Steam, on PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 came a bit later, but it was out there on all the platforms, uh, very, very important platforms as well. And it sold together with the Humble Bundle around a million units um, and was very successful for the two developers. Um, but the problem is on that story that it's not a... It's not a first game story. I met Andy Schatz, um, I don't know, like two years ago um, at a dinner from Humble Bundle. And I was like super excited to hear like, like, like how everything worked at Monaco and so on. And he was actually telling me that he was in the game industry p before since seven years developing games. And then at some point just deciding, I have this concept of Monaco. I want to bring it out. I can't do it in the current, current company or under the current circumstances. Um, and so he decided to develop Monaco on his own as an indie. So this is actually not a typical first game story because Andy Schatz, um, he, was exact, he knew exactly what he was doing and had a lot of experience from games that you know, have not been as successful as Monaco. So um, that story kind of was like, like, is one example of a first game story that I always felt like something cool. He came from nowhere and then he did that game. And, um, but actually, Andy had a lot of experience uh, while developing this project. Although, of course, you know, being indie at that time was something completely new. So but let's take a look at another story. Um, some fellow developer friends of mine um, from a Danish company called the Beta Dwarfs. They did a game called Forest. Uh, it was developed... Uh, for quite a long time. It's, it's kind of a similar story as Beat Buddy also started as a university project. Um, then they got more and more people. They had this super successful Imgur post describing the whole story. I think it was the most click Imgur, f the second most click Imgur photo of 2014. Um, it's a really weird story. You should really check it out. Um, so that was quite good marketing. Of course, they had a Kickstarter campaign. Um, that was successful, that helped a lot to build up the momentum. They've been out then, so far I think only on Steam, but Steam has been super successful for them. Um, that means they actually are now able, um, after it was this close, to bring out the first Forced Force game because they were running out of money. The two founders actually took a private credit, a private, private bank loan, over 200,000 euros. So if, if, they, if they would have failed, they you know, would have need to swipe floors or work at McDonald's for the rest of their life. Which can be cool if you get a discount on hamburgers or something like that. But yeah, if you, if you want to make games, this would have been hell. But it worked. It worked. And um, they're now working on Force 2. And for me, that's one of the very, very few successful first game stories that I actually know of. And... Um, I actually want to talk now a bit about what happened to us because uh, we brought this game out, Beat Buddy, and uh, the big question that I always had, especially in the last two years, was it now successful? Was it a successful first game or was it a failed first game? Um, so let me just describe really, really fast um, some details about the project. So it's now out on iOS and on Steam. It's coming to consoles this year. Uh, the concept behind it is that it's a musical action adventure, um, the first of its kind, because you're basically playing an adventure level, but at the same time you have a musical, since we built this sound technology where all the different instruments are realized um, 
are visualized by game mechanics. And um, but you're going to see that in a second on the trailer. It's impossible to pitch. Um, and yeah, we had the pleasure to work with a lot of cool artists. Grammy nominee Austin Wintery, who did the music on Journey, the Banner Saga, and a lot of other cool games. Also, Power of Stella doing awesome electro swing music. So we had this 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 uh, awesome people joining. Also, Brianna Pratchett helped us with the polishing of the script. She did um, the stories on Tomb Raider, the good Tomb Raider, the new one, not the old one, and um, Mirror's Edge. So that was really really nice. Um, and yeah, it took us four years to develop the game, and we even have our um, we even have our own Beat Buddy album. We have our plushies. We have a gigantic Beat Buddy guy who was already at 12 shows around the world. So, um, been quite a lot of things happening. I'm just going to show you a trailer real quick to give you an understanding on how the game looks. <laughs> So this is uh, to give you an idea on, on what the game is roughly about. And uh, now first, I'm going to sit myself on the success couch, which, is, which I decided to be over here. So over here, if you watch it also later on, in the panels, only the successful people sit on the left side. Um, so let me now tell you the story why the game was, was actually successful. I hope the clicker works. Yeah. OK, so we started developing in 2009. Marketing-wise, the game won over 14 international awards and nominations, including two Level Up awards at E3, um, uh, German Game Award, two German Developer Awards. We beat Crisis 3 in Best Game Design, why ever, wherever, I don't understand, but that was really cool. Um, also, awards from the music industry, so that's, uh, that's very nice. Good story. Um, also, 75% Metacritic, that was really cool. Um, for your first title, I think that's something you can be pretty proud of. Um, and also, yeah, the game was showcased everywhere around the world. I think we've been on all PAXs, PAX Australia, PAX Prime, PAX, PAX East, REST, Gamescom, um, Nordic, Unite, uh, basically, except the Tokyo Game Show, I don't actually know where we haven't been. So, so that's from a marketing point of view. I think a lot of people heard about the game and saw the game. Um, so that was extremely nice. From the distribution point of view, uh, now we sold more than 700,000 units, which sounds pretty cool. Um, and also, we had worldwide features on basically all the stores we've been to. On the uh, App Store for the iOS release, we had two worldwide features. And in Germany, we've been six weeks in a row on the front page. Um, that was also extremely nice. Um, and yeah, there's actually more platforms coming. So that means we this year we're going to have the console releases, Xbox One uh, and Wii U, uh, maybe even more platforms and an Android version coming out as well. So that sounds pretty cool. Also, the game generated a little bit of money. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of tough to say how much it's directly because we also won some prize, prize money and stuff. But at the moment, maybe $180,000, which is, yeah. It's uh, yeah. I think I'm gonna tell about that a bit later. So um, did my did my clicker die? Oh yeah. Okay. Let me check real quick. I maybe have to use my hands. Uh, bop, bop, bop. Did that work? Yeah. Okay. So that was the success story. As you can remember, I was sitting over there. Now I'm sitting over here because it's also a fail story. So. Let me sit on my couch, have my vodka here, and talk about what happened. We developed the game, 
70% of the team left. It was ter terrible on the marketing. We were working for two years on a major music label deal and it was completely for nothing. I don't know how many telephone calls and stupid emails I wrote to get one stupid album out. It was such super annoying. Then on the distribution side, it was only 7,000 copies in the first six months, which is like below our worst, worst expectations. Um, then from the revenue point of view, it's been bankruptcy for the company so, so many times in the end of 2013. Um, I think our average per sold copy is 20 cents or something like that. And the game was sold for 15 euros initially. So, uh, fuck sold copies. <laughs> um, and also, yeah, the, the game was in full production, let's say, 400,000 euros or something like that. And as you've seen before, this is not really a return on invest. So this sounds like a pretty failed story. So now I was wondering, um, is that I was, I was feeling a bit sitting on this couch, like, like uh, being extremely sad that so many people needed to leave, that the game was not doing as well as we thought it would be. But on the other side, I was super happy that, that you know, um, it got so much recognition, was played by so many people, it's even translated in Russian, it's, 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 uh, we still have the console releases going on, this is like super, super cool. So I was like always worried about, yeah, was it, was it nice, was it actually bad? And I was always asking myself, so, so was it a successful first game? And then I realized something, um, and I want to share that with you right now, that actually um, success is not, is not, uh, one straight word, it's actually a mixture of two elements. So um, one of those elements is emotional success, and this is what we had right here. That means winning awards, getting your game seen by other people, um, getting emails about, yeah, that was really cool, I played the game, thanks so much for that, uh, it changed my life, I have 20 kids <laughs> No, that I never gotten that email. But um, yeah, maybe, you know, we still have the console releases, so maybe I'm going to get that email. Um, so, you know, those are all the emotional things, or like having a having an article on IGN or Kotaku or Rock Paper Shotgun and, and getting your good Metacritic. Those are all the, the, the good things on an emotional side that makes you happy as a developer. And I think this is for most of us developers the reason why we actually start joining this wonderful industry um, to, to have our ideas seen and played by other people and get feedback from them and, and, and maybe even make them happy by playing them. But the problem is, since success is such a bitch, <laughs> um, you, most of us start because of the emotional success, but in order to survive and make your second game, you actually have a need to have a different form of success. And that's financial success. And the problem is that Financial success and emotional success are not two good friends. They're not brothers, they're more like stepsisters fighting each other and they don't want to be at the same party. Um, you have to force them to be on the same party. Um, so, and this is actually why I'm, I was like taking a look back the last six years basically to see how did our emotional success and our financial success behave over the, over the years and what was important for us. And I want to um, share some of those, those, those things that we discovered. And um, maybe there's something interesting for you there as well. Maybe you recognize yourself um, um, to some points and maybe it helps you to, even if your game did not sell the one million copies yet or didn't make you rich, that it was still not a failure because you might have achieved your emotional success points, but maybe not the financial success points yet. Um, okay, so let's start with the pre-story. The pre-story starts in a university in Hamburg in uh, 2009. Um, and we had this idea of a video game where um, the music would not be um, just background music. It would, basically it would basically be an interactive level design. So that means um, you could only move to certain sounds if they're on the screen and if the mix is getting louder and bigger you would have more and more sounds kicking in and I'm just going to show you the first 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 version of Beat Buddy in a very early stage in the microscope state um, that was in September 2009 and back then it was still about a music virus basically and as you can see uh, the young Beat Buddy is and can only move to the bass drum and now the snare is kicking in and the snare has a different movement pattern. So what we did is um, 
we uh, had more and more instruments kicking in into the level and each of those instruments and sounds would give you a new way to move. And you kind of needed to understand how all the instruments work in order to progress. And now, for example, you are collecting a new movement pattern. And yeah, the music would get... So, and, and as you could hear, while the music would get more and more complex, more and more elements would happen on the screen and you can have more and more moves depending on different, different beats. And that's actually the, the video, because there was, there was a mock-up video, uh, it, was, it was not yet a game. Um, and this is what got us started. So we've been at an art university in Germany and we had no clues what to do. We, I tried out a lot of things. Um, photography, advertising, and um, I was even a construction worker for two years. I was also a paramedic for two years. That was also a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, I just felt I wanted, wanted to, yeah, I, I, I just had no, no idea basically back then that I was, could be a part of the game industry with my ideas. And then Unity came along. I think we started at 1.5. And we were able, also as graphic designers with only one coder, to actually create a proto prototype. And also, we felt the air of self-publishing because it was pub possible because of iOS to bring out your own games without knowing everybody at Nintendo, knowing everybody at EA, and so on. Um, so that sounded fantastic. And we heard about the indies in the US, um, like the Super Meat Boy guys and, and Andy Shads and so on, who've, who've been very inspiring for us back then. So um, the first thing was then basically we had this idea of making this game. We stopped going to university. We somehow got our degree, but I can't remember anymore because I was already traveling to GDC at that time. And we had our first office. The team was growing. This is um, some of the unlockables you can get if you're playing the game. It's basically our story together with pictures from the last six, six years. So we had our first office in my, uh, my parents' attic. This is always where we had breakfast. Uh, on the left side is the attic, and this is us three founders back then. And um, this is also the three freaks, was then threeks, so yeah. And it's also good for Google promotion. Uh, threeks, nobody's called threeks. I have one studio, um, one befriended studio, they're called the Black Pants. It, they did this awesome game called Tiny and Big, and if you type them in on Google, you will find women underwear for the first 200 pages. So, so Threeks was a good name back then for Google. Um, so, and what happened then? Uh, we were starting with the development. We were a bit lost what to do. Then we went to our first GDC in San Francisco in 2011, and during that time, we got nominated for the German Video Game Award in the student category. And I told everybody there, look, do you know who you're talking to? You're talking to a German Video Game Award nominee. So give us your money for getting the game ready. German Video Game Award, just for the understanding, at that time, is not that spectacular. It, it sounds really spectacular, but it's actually not. So, so, but it worked, so we were able to talk with the first industry guys, and it was just a great show. And um, ever since we've been to GDC every, every March. Um, and then we were actually lucky to found the company, so things gotten happier and more exciting. We were showing at Gamescom our first prototype, that was really, really cool. Then I think one of the coolest things was that we got an IGF honorable mention um, for our sound ideas. That was super sweet. So, so as you can see, excitement was rising. Um, then things got even cooler. We won two Interlevel Up Awards at E3. Um, so we went for the first time to E3. There was also like, I can always remember it as a little kid on the games papers where you have every July, you had like this those 20 extra pages of E3 of all the great games there, so we were able to go there ourselves. The good side effect was by winning those awards, we had our um, demo up on Steam, which was extremely nice because um, so many people could play our game, and Steam was back then still a fortress, um, so that was extremely awesome. Then excitement was as a super, super peak. It was never as high as that. It's an unhealthy high, I would say, uh, because we had our game funded, we had a new office, and we were actually lucky to work with eight people. So 
that was super super nice and then things gotten a bit uh yeah crunchy a lot of pressure a lot of problems um uh because it's you know we had all the possibilities to develop the game we had the team but we didn't have the experience at that time to actually know what would happen and also with the music music deals that we wanted to do um, by winning all those awards and getting all this feedback from press, there's also big pressure on you um, if you if you can deliver what you promised to deliver. Um, so the year or the time before the release was a very very tough time, and um, yeah, it's uh, yeah just very very tough. Um, so now let's look. Since I'm German, I like numbers, so so now I'm trying to compare a different graph together with that showing how much money was on our bank account so in the beginning of course um, if you start you have no money because it's not important you just love developing games but at some point you realize whoops if you want to do this full time with three four five six people uh, and, and we didn't have rich parents or didn't have a grandmother dying or with cash coming in or I don't know, we were not pirates, so we couldn't steal a ship or, and sell it or whatever. So we basically needed to find out how to finance this game because we knew um, um, with the idea of it, it needed at least half a year or a year of development. This was still in 2010. So um, we were lucky to find our first work for hire job on this little game called Hermes Run. It's about a mailman trying to be quicker than the sun to deliver packages and stuff. It was a was a fun project. <laughs> was a it was a fun project, and we had our first money for for the company. Then we actually had um, two fundings from the German government. One was for this the technology fund for the sound technology that was fifty thousand euros, and the other one. But you know German law, right? So um, um, you need to make you need to plan ahead your fifty thousand euros, and if you just have a slight change of what you're going to spend it half a year later on let's say you need new printer paper then you need to fill out four letters describing why you need to allocate those three euro fifty um, from your pc money to the um, printer money for paper so it was actually kind of a pain in the ass but of course it was good money so um, then we got another funding uh, that was 120,000 euros which is actually a startup fund if you have a great business idea and our business idea was to bring together the music industry and the games industry in this product um, and that was extremely cool so we were able to work out our business business plan and we're also safe to go on with the prototype at Gamescom um, then we won money from the music industry by winning the first prize at the Music Works Award and um, that was 25,000 euros and in order to found a company you need 25,000 euros so bam that money was spent um, and we had a company yay that was really cool but um, yeah as you can see of course uh, money was running out at some time but uh, I wouldn't say at the very last moment but at a very critical time we were lucky to find um, people believing in the idea and believing in our team and so uh, we found an investor um, financing the project of BeatBuddy till the release which was extremely cool as you can see on our bank account um, and uh, yes yeah, so money was coming in and out from the whole investment and um, as you could see uh, money was like things already changed here so we were always happier than we had money in our bank account and at that point it was already changing but that's something for the second part of it so now we come to the release phase so everything else was pre-production you just saw four years of my life put into ten minutes um, and now you hear two more years or basically one more year of my life put into another ten minutes um, so developing the game for four years the steam release was just around the corner august 6 was was the timing and um, we were pushing all the marketing channels trying whatever we could to make things happen so that means we traveled with our beat buddy costume around the world to to pax east to all the shows it's me there on the left side in the costume is like it gets 500 million degrees in there if you dance for more than one hour and since beat buddy is a dancer you have to dance non-stop uh, so blood sweat and tears and um, but I think it was important also we were making this documentary about us developing the game and here's one episode um, from the Trix News yeah. Yeah. Welcome. this is 
Wolf Lang. This is Steve Leisha. And this is Streaks TV. Ah, fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> I'm a bit excited. Uh, it's my first show. Is that water? Yeah, yeah, it's water. But it's not pee. No, not yet. What? It, it's not pee. Go. After the last show was such a big hit. 300 views is a success. 300 is viral. We got promoted and got into this all new studio. We got a new background. We got a giant pen. We got a new anchor. And who are you? <laughs> I'm Steve, as I told. How long are you here? Uh, basically the same time as you are. You were here for four years and we didn't see each other. I'm gonna give you an F for not being more happier. <laughs> Steve, great that you're here, but where is Lawrence? Lawrence is at a conference. I wonder if we could get any material from that. Hello! I am standing here at the Rust Conference in Birmingham, UK. Uh, it's been great. Uh, we have Beat Buddy here, of course, on the show. People seem to love and enjoy the game. Uh, also, all the other games that are here. It's been a fantastic ride. But back to the studio. Yeah, super exciting news, Lawrence. <laughs> no, we're not a fake news show. No, no we're, we're not, not just sitting here in our attic. We got a lot of good press coverage coming out of that, and we also showed some brand new screenshots. New screenshots, you say? New oh, screenshots. Awesome, Steve. So take a look at them. This is the man. This is the ruins. Here's a beat gun. And this is this is me in a bathtub. Do we have any other news there? <laughs> you wanna get fired? It was a great week for Threeks and for Beatbody, of course. Was it? Yeah, it was. Um, Why are you so skeptical? Uh, you look a bit just tired. I'm surprised that, uh, yeah, I was drinking last night. Oh, you were drinking last night? Heavily. This week, the localization of our game started. It's gonna be on German, French, English, Espanol, Italiano, Japanese, Japanese, Hi! 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 And not to forget, Seven languages. Not five. Seven. Wait, I gotta take a call. Not Hello? The, not the mom joke. <laughs> Stevie, it's your mom. It's your mom, Stevie. She's asking when you're coming home. Today we want to show you some technical background on how we all produce our game. So, take a look on how we did the animation for the main character, Beat Buddy. We actually did mocap. His swimming moves are super smooth. It was, it was very expensive. I'm German, but... I can't say it any better. This is how we got the punch animation done. Impressive what you can do nowadays with mocap. Mocap for a 2D game? Isn't that a bit expensive? We got the money. Oh wait, I'm getting a call right now. It's your mom, Steve. So Steve, I heard the beta started since last week for Beat Button. Yeah, so... This should just give you an idea that, that we really try to be over all channels, like communicating our story, what was happening, the, the passion behind the game and everything. And um, then the release came um, on August 6th on Steam and, and we had this gigantic release party, which is a bad idea if you, if you release a game and you're totally drunk. <laughs> uh, then if things go bad, you might need another day to realize how bad they went. And this is what happened in our case. So while I was still at the Reeperbahn, running around with a lot of good friends from Finland and the Netherlands and so on, uh, um, we realized uh, that we only sold, instead of the 10,000 or 5,000 copies, we only sold uh, 600 copies. Yeah, that was really, really bad. But luckily, I was still too drunk to understand that. Um, so, so what basically happened is we had this super high excitement build up about the release Things were like, like, like uh, yeah, 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 it was just crazy. If you develop a game over four years and then you really can bring and bring it out, it's just amazing. But um, yeah, the sales were extremely bad. Um, the critics were actually good. Uh, we had a lot of press um, reviews. We had a lot of YouTubers going, going, going on. But the team was just super crunched down and super scared and it was a terrible time. Um, yeah, and things didn't didn't get better in the next months. We've been to PAX Prime and to Gamescom, been been like promoting the hell out of the game, but it just led to 500 copies or something like that. So it was, yeah, it looked like everything's over now. So um, the team needed to leave, or a lot of people left at that time. First of all, we couldn't pay the salaries. The other thing was also that after four years of being in a startup, you you might want to do something else than just eating McDonald's, one euro burgers the whole time, you want to have a life or something like that. And that was, looked really hard to have it in this company. 
So we needed to move out of our beautiful office, uh, make everything to gold um, to somehow survive. We moved back to my parents where we started four, four years ago. And uh, then when things were the lowest to the lowest to the lowest, we won two developer awards, uh, which surprised us a lot. And um, it surprised us so much that we, we were standing on stage and I didn't even say anything or Bulas didn't say anything. We just took a bottle of champagne and got ourselves wet because since we thought this was the last time we would have the chance to be on stage, I wanted to end it in style. Um, and we were actually thinking that we won 20,000 euros, uh, which, was, which is a very, very good feeling. If you think you won 20,000, like just imagine winning 20,000 euros, that's a very positive feeling. So we had that over Christmas. The problem was when we woke up after Christmas, um, we made the call about, hey, yeah, so where's that money? So where's that money we won from the awards? Ah, yeah, this year there, there was no prize money. Uh, some press were quoting something from a Wikipedia article and it sounded nice, but yeah, if you have read the small lines, then sorry, no money. And we're like, hmm, okay, what did we do with the 20,000 euros that we didn't want? Oh, yeah, we bought our GDC San Francisco tickets. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, um, um, things were even worse, worse, worse at that time. But it was, just like I said, it's a really good feeling thinking that you just won 20,000 euros. Hope, hope it happens to all of us at some point. It's even better if you actually win the money. That's, that's, that's even, I think you don't have the bad wake up. Um, yeah, so, but then... Then things gotten all of a sudden better. I'm going to say that in the financial slide. The one reason was that BeatBuddy got included in the um, um, Humble Indie Bundle 11 with games like Monaco and Guacamole and, and, and uh, The Swapper and like, like all these awesome indie super hits. And um, that was extremely cool because all of a sudden a lot of people heard about BeatBuddy, um, which was nice. It was a very successful GDC for us. Then we won the German Video Game Award. Um, which is super, super crazy because uh, you get 75,000 euros by winning the German Video Game Award. And um, 75,000 euros, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and, and we were also very, very surprised of winning that. And this time we were really happy because we knew we really won the money. Uh, because I think I would have killed myself when I woke up two months afterwards. Oh yeah, those 75,000 euros, yeah, it's not going to happen. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so that was cool. Then we've been to the games, Gamescom. We've been to the first indie mega booth at Gamescom. Um, um, that was a lot of fun. We actually had four versions of Beat Budding show, showcase there. That was extra cool. And then we had the iOS version coming, coming out with a worldwide feature and so on. Um, so things actually became from terrible nightmare to okayish nice. But as you can see, although a lot of good things were happening, like actually solid things, like not hoping we would be successful. We've actually been successful. We've never been as far up as we used to be back then. And I'm actually going to explain why in a second. So to move back to the release time, we had this eight people team. Um, we had five months of financial buffer. But um, after the release failed, with a high burn rate and a lot of employees, your money is shrinking like crazy. Um, so, and all our plans that we had, we thought the worst we would do is sell 5,000 copies in the first month. And I think it was like 2,000 then in the first month. Um, so we needed to cut down our burn rate as fast as possible, fire us all, not fire us all, but stop paying our salaries, just like the good old days. We needed to leave our office and freeze all expenses um, and just wait for the miracle. And when we were this close to bankruptcy, close to Christmas 2013, the Christmas miracle happened. We've been included in a um, Steam flash sale and in eight hours we sold twice as much copies as in the first six months. And that was just crazy. So the company was instantly saved. I was actually super angry at that time because it's like it's been four years of working my ass off, being to every show and then, you know, like, like, like the Steam flash sale was like saving the company instantly, but what did I do? Why didn't the stuff that I want to do didn't work like that? So it was a change of mind and a different mindset about how efficient I should spend my time developing games or promoting games. And um, yeah, then of course we had the humble, humble bundle revenue that helped a lot. Then the German Video Game Award money, bam, taxpayer money right there in my pocket. 
Um, that was that was cool. Then we had a Gamescom, a, a Steam Weekly deal, and then we had the iOS release. So actually, uh, some nice uh, cash. Very very good. I like. Um, but as you can see, uh, just to analyze those curves, um, although our money was shrinking like crazy, we were getting more and more excited about it. Very bad combination. Um, when we were close to bankruptcy, our happiness was adjusting more and more to the way we felt. And um, then, especially in the first months after things gotten better, we were, wouldn't allow us to be more happy than the money on our bank account. And then even if we had more money, uh, we wouldn't be more happy about it and we would never go back to the time as before. Um, so basically, what I wanted to say with that is that uh, um, we had some learnings. The one thing, of course, is like I can stand here now saying we sold 700,000 copies, but as you see in the last six years, most of the time we were a failure, a complete failure. Um, not a complete failure, but we were sitting on, I think that was the failing couch. Yeah, okay, so we were sitting on that couch. Maybe now we're slowly sitting on that couch. I don't know, um, because the financial success is now slowly, slowly coming as well. And yeah, it's like, like this is something that helped me a lot to not blame myself for not being rich with video games because I was rich from the emotional success side. People liked the game, some people bought it, we got good reviews, we made, maybe even made some people happy, so, so there, was a, there was a rich success. But on the financial side, it didn't work and it took me quite a while to figure out that we've never been in, in it in the beginning on the emotional um, on the financial success side. We always want to just make games. Um, but we needed to realize that in order to live from it and to go on with making more games, you need to make at least a little bit money to finance your next production. Um, and also what we realized is that I'm not getting too stressed about if things go really, really bad, because as long as you have a long-term goal and you don't lose that goal um, out of your sight, things will always go up and down. And don't worry about if things go bad. This, this doesn't mean that ultimately everything will fail. And also, I think it's important to define your personal success because um, I was, I think the whole team and I was extremely sad that we didn't have the financial success. But just like I said, we, we've never been in there for the financial success. We were just hoping if you make the awesome, great, a great game, that money will come naturally. But that's not the case in most cases. Um, so, so like personally, I was always in it for 80% fun, 80% emotions, 20% money. Um, I needed to have a little bit of change of para paradigm. Nowadays, after like the company won so many awards and the game was successful and so on, I'm actually curious how to make a living from video video games. So financial success is something I'm I'm trying to work on. I'm trying to understand um, how you can make games um, actually profitable, but not making them free to play, but you know as a premium premium title. So this is something that I'm thinking about a lot lately. And we also have a new formula for not feeling miserable about great games that you develop. Um, it's basically the, the idea that our emotional happiness is money on the bank account divided through two. It's that easy. No, it's actually not that easy, but, but it just works really, really well that, that, that uh, you, you shouldn't be 10 times as happy if you only have 1,000 euros on your bank account, then you should be really worried that your company might soon be dead. Um, but that's just something for my internal uh, thinking progress to, to, to keep the company and us on our feet and not get swept away by, oh, this IGN article, which is, which is super, super awesome. But how many copies sold? Five? Okay, fuck it. So um, that's the way of thinking, at least for us, um, if you want to keep on making games. Um, but how can you find out for you what you think is important, um, what you want to achieve? Like some, some advices before I end, I can give you, you have to be realistic. Um, about estimated numbers. So if you read on Gama Sutra, this guy sold 700,000 copies uh, or 500,000 copies or 1 million copies, then very likely, first of all, that's not going to be you because the average of players or average of games won't sell more than two or 3,000 copies. So rather plan, plan with that number. Plus, as you can see, yes, 7,000 uh, 7, sold copies, but we only sold them for 20 cents a piece because the game was actually a failure. So that doesn't mean anything. Um, only that you can resurrect somehow a dead game, maybe that, but yeah, so, so, so be realistic about, um, um, 
be realistic about numbers. And also don't estimate with luck. Don't think you're the coolest person in this world. Don't think you're the god of game design because very likely you're not. And if you have this uber success for some reasons, uh, then be happy about it, but uh, don't plan with it because very likely it's not going to happen. Um, and also, like I said before, the whole don't think you're that person or that person or that person. Like also, if you see very successful indie developers, they might have worked eight or ten years very, very hard for that to have that one successful game. So don't get fooled by that. And I think the most important thing is like you have to gather experiences. You have to find out um, um, how it feels to fail and how it feels if you want to still be in that industry, if you've seen both sides of it and not only the game jams and the good times and hanging around. If you want to see your friends go, if you want to see your team go, um, and if you're close to bankruptcy, if you don't know if you can go on, like, like see all sides of it and then decide for yourself if you seriously want to make games. And um, of course, ask other developers uh, what they experienced. So, um, go around here. Everybody is not a dick. Everybody is super nice. The game industry is a is a super super cool industry, and you can basically ask everybody what they experienced, and um, very likely they will tell you what happened. So listen to them and share your story, and don't be don't feel bad that you made a unsuccessful game, because everybody did. Um, and I think the most important thing in the end uh, is that you need to be honest about your own personal goals. Are you in it for the money? Are you in it for the emotions? Are you in it for both? Um, and then make those games. If you want to make your free-to-play games and want to drive on your yacht, do that. If you want to uh, change somebody's life by making a great game that is a uh, super unique experience but will never sell more than 10 copies or is maybe not even for sale, um, then do that. But, you know, like, just know what you're in for. And just at the very, very end, was it a successful game? So am I sitting on this couch or on that couch? Like, I think for me now, it was a big success because otherwise I wouldn't be standing here telling you our story. And uh, so I'm therefore very, very happy. Spasibo. Uh, I hope that's the right word. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a very, very inspiring story. Cool, I think you can sit on Success Coach. Oh, nice, right now. nice, <laughs> nice. Can I really do that? And now, guys, I'm sure you have something to ask. Just show off hand. Oh, yeah, I, we, I can see someone in the end of the hall, okay. Let's give uh, applause to our volunteer. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, basically what I caught from your story is that if it wasn't for two industries that you were covering, can, uh, gaming like, uh, and music... I can almost not understand you. It's like... I'm asking uh, if it wasn't for two industries that you were covering, the gaming and the music, uh, so the music part saved your business like two or three times, right? Okay, that's, that's actually the interesting part because, uh, um, so we were, just like I said, we were trying to make those two games. We were trying to make something for the music industry and we were trying for the game industry. And I would say in the end, like at least my job was, I had 70% of my work was dealing with the music industry and only 30% was dealing with the game industry because the music industry is such a pain in the ass. It's just terrible, terrible, terrible. And most of them can all go to hell because they deserve it. Um, but the point is that, that since this was such an integral part of the whole concept, I was always pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And just this uh, deal with the major music label that I was after for two years, just for getting a stupid album out, just an album. Um, it, I don't know, took me, I think I spent one month of my lifetime trying to make that deal happen somehow. And then talking with somebody from Steam or talking to Austin Wintry asking if he makes music for you. There was, there was one friendly call at a conference, uh, not call, talk, talk, at, talk at a conference, and then it worked. So this is actually also why we are for our next project, very likely uh, we're not going to do anything music related anymore. Um, now it's fun with Beat Buddy because people understand the concept and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I would love to focus more on being a game developer. That's uh, the better part of my life. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, other question. Uh, here you said that uh, it was like a bit of a 
sucking the resources uh, for hiring an office and uh, residing your team in there. So why haven't you considered a remote work? So like team sits in their houses and they work through internet, you know? Um, we are a very tricky company and we are very tricky people. And uh, we actually, with our first funding, um, those, those 50,000 euros in 2010, we were trying to work with people remote and even have like strangers in our office once in a while and they totally fucked us over. <laughs> so we are developing games because of trust and because we believe in a great concept. And I really had this one guy, um, he was like pretending for one month to develop something, coding something, but since I'm a graphic designer, I had no idea if he was lying to me or not. And he was straight into my face. And um, then that one time, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually still funny for me. So, and that one time when he was in the office, I was telling him, hey, dude, if you don't get your shit done in the next week, as he promised, I cannot pay you for anything. You know, it's not going to work. And then when I was talking to him and he had the chance to save his ass, he fell asleep. He was, <laughs> he was, really, <laughs> he was really falling asleep, sitting next to me, talking about like, like if he would to solve the situation and he fell asleep and I went out of the office and I was talking to Bula and said, dude, the programmer fell asleep. What should I do? I, I wanted to punch him in the face but I felt that was unfair because he was sleeping. So, and like, no, he was not sleeping. Nobody sleeps when... It's... And then he goes in like, dude, he's really sleeping. So, um, we didn't have... Let's say it like that, um, with the trust and the unexperiences we had before, uh, good experiences with working remote or with working with people that are not part of the team. Um, so I think that's that's the main reason why most why we stay together in an office. Thanks, uh, Alexey Riga, Mets Work. Uh, well, I didn't play your game actually, but uh, I saw initial concept you showed us and uh, final game, and it looks like two very, very different things. Yeah. So you like started with the idea to make music and uh, like gameplay together, but final product for me, I didn't play it again. Yeah. Uh, looks like you create a kind of platformer with like nice music. Why are you saying about any kind of success here? Because it looks like you created not game you wanted, but what like people wanted, or it's not like that, or you changed for that time, or? No, uh, no it's actually you, actually gave another talk about that topic that we actually developed four games in the last four years. So this is what I said about like being a real developer. We always came to this point where we showcased the game somewhere and then we thought it was not good enough and we erased it from scratch and started all over again. So basically also the game that came out in the end, um, you know, it's an adventure with Rihanna Pratchett and 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 uh, and it's a musical and it's and it's also this story and those platforming elements and stuff but the initial idea was just to visualize and and make music um, experienceable in a complete new way so because of all the pressure and all the all the inexperiences we were we were getting more and more ideas into this project until the initial idea was ruined and now uh, it's a compromise of everything. It's a little bit of an adventure, it's a little bit of 2D graphics, Raymond, Raymond style, it's a little bit of great music, a little bit of a great story. And, and, uh, and so, so, yeah, it's, uh, this is maybe also one of the reasons why it didn't work in the first place to be a success. Because it was not the game that we, we believed in to be. It was a we were too scared of making decisions because everybody wanted to do something with the game. And um, yeah, if I would have known that, I think, think uh, on the one side I wouldn't be sitting here because it was a good experience also on, all, on how the hierarchy in the company should work. If you start from university, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have that as well. If you start as a student, student project, every's opinion matters the most. But very likely one of the people is carrying the vision and he and if he's not able to succeed with the vision, the game is going to be mediocre. So, um, but that's, I think, so everybody has to learn it that way. Um, I'm actually just going to show you something real quick that is a little bit related to this question, but not that much. Um, but just showing you of what happens if you are started making a game that you really believed in, and in the end, it doesn't turn out to be 100% the thing you want it to be. Um, so, I was starting a photo series about 
uh, taking photos from developers when they were actually um, starting with the game and they knew they would make the game. So this is like 870 days before the release of Beat Buddy, uh, me at the first Amaze conference. And this is actually right after the release, um, after dancing for two hours in the costume, been crunching for four to five months. So this is what the game industry can do with you. The problem is though that, that we had a failed game but for example, here's a good friend of mine from the example from Force, is Steffen, this was his Kickstarter campaign video 600 days before Force came out, and this is how he looked uh, two days before the release. So, so I think, think like, uh, yeah, game development can or will hurt you badly when it comes to the release, no matter if you're failing or not failing. But there was just something extra I wanted to have for the end. Thanks so much for your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your answers. Thanks for your questions. And uh, now we have our five minutes break, only five minutes, and then see you right here.